The radio tube was developed in the early 1900s and phased out, except for special applications, in the 1970s. This is a brief story of its development and use. The first practical detector was the coherer a crude device used between 1898 and 1905. This is a rare 1901 model made by the British Marconi Company. The most popular of all non-tube type of radio detectors was the crystal detector developed around 1905 or 1906. The crystal set was used by both the amateur and commercial operator until about World War I. We're looking at a 1914 commercial crystal set. The ship operator had the choice of three minerals for DX or local reception. The crystal detector was a diode and the forerunner of the modern transistor. The ability for a tube to rectify was first recognized by Thomas Edison in 1884. Here tube historian Howard Schrader is holding an early Edison light bulb with a hairpin type filament. With DC on the filament, one side would be positive, and the impurities in the tube would leave a shadow on the positive side of the glass. This was known as the Edison effect. Edison reason current was flowing toward the positive side of the filament. He added a plate and applied voltage and found current would flow. Thus was born the diode rectifier. In 1904, Sir Ambrose Fleming of the Marconi Company patented this rectifying action as a diode detector, which in turn made it the first radio tube. We are looking at an original 1905 Fleming valve worth several thousand dollars. In 1906 and 7, Lee DeForest developed the first modern radio tube by adding a grid between the filament and plate. Now the tube would not only detect, but also amplify. And in time, they found that it would oscillate and generate radio signals. At first, the DeForest Audion, as it was called, was mounted on a separate box with external coils and tuning devices. Others, too, were working on vacuum tubes. This is a rare LRS relay tube developed in Germany in 1910. All early tubes were gassy and gave erratic performance. By 1916, several companies were making tubes of different design. We're looking at the inside of an early Audiotron. Note the coil-type grid and cylindrical aluminum plate. The basic tube patents were held by DeForest and Fleming at Marconi Company. Others tried to circumvent these patents by placing an element on the outside of the tube. The makers of this Welsh diode suggested the user could have a triode by winding wire around the tube. Needless to say, these makeshift methods were ineffective. 
For amplification, the grid head to be between the filament and the plate. And now, the famous type VT1 tube, developed by Western Electric during World War I. The prefix VT is a military designation for vacuum tube. By the end of World War I, a triode vacuum tube had fairly well taken over as a detector. Here is a well-known one-tube ship receiver, the IP-501. The tube is behind the little door at the upper right. All tubes were not necessarily mounted in sockets. Here are some Marconi tubes uh, located on clips instead of uh, the conventional socket. I might add that up until now, all the tubes and equipment you have seen uh, in this little show are in the AWA Museum. And this is what an amateur station looked like in 1922. The huge 1KW spark transmitter at left is being replaced by the quiet vacuum tube. Now let's look at the triode. This is a basic one tube receiver. The power for the filament was always known as the A. And the plate circuit, the B. And the grid, C. Under most circumstances, the C voltage was eliminated through a resistor or bias network. A display panel of American receiving tubes made between 1920 and 1924, the period of the first great development and the birth of broadcasting. I will show other panels, all from the famous Patrick Dowd tube collection at Manhattan College. Without a doubt, the most popular tube of all time was the 201 and its several variations. Made by General Electric for RCA, it was first made available in 1921. RCA held a firm grip on the triode patent and discouraged others from manufacturing it. It immediately became popular with the amateur and the broadcast listener. And here is the 201 family starting at left in 1921. The final version, the 01A of the 1930s at the far right. Just about every receiver used the UX201A tube in 1925 and 1926. This is an Atwater Kent 3 tube broadcast receiver with horn speaker. The tubes are quite spectacular when lighted. And now a popular amateur Greeby receiver. See the three small holes in the front panel? The operator could peek in and note the brilliancy of the tubes. And this is what one looked like in total darkness, or at least this is what my camera captured. The most popular broadcast receiver of the 20s was the famous three dialer consisting of two stages of RF detector and two stages of audio for a total of five tubes. Although the super head had been developed, RCA was reluctant to license it. The three dialers took many forms. Here is one held by Ken Conrad, W2IIE, mounted in glass. These were the days when it was popular to make your own broadcast receiver. This Sergeant Raymond may well be the ultimate in a tuned RF receiver, having four 
tune RF stages plus a detector or five tune circuits. Others may say, however, the best set may have been the little one tube regenerative receiver. Many a boy had his first thrill to listen to radio with such a receiver. All early receivers used batteries as a power source. However, in time, power supplies were developed from the 110 volt power mains. This is a collection of early rectifiers. The 280 was the most popular for receivers and in time the 866 at upper right for the transmitter. This is an unusual display of early transmitting tubes starting with the 250 watt P tube at upper left of 1919. With the exception of the DeForest H tube, they were all made by General Electric for RCA. And now the most popular transmitting tubes of the 20s. The first transmitting tube available to the amateur was the 5 water, the UV202. This was soon superseded in the mid-twenties by the all-time favorite, the UX-210. The more affluent amateur would use the high-power 203A. Most all transmitters until 1930 were usually one-tube self-excited oscillators. Seen here is a popular combination described by George Grammer in a 1929 QST. The one tube TNT transmitter is at left and a two tube regenerative receiver at right. This is a complete amateur station. The power, oh, anywhere from one to 10 watts depending on the tube and the power supply. Battery operation was expensive. Various methods were tried to add the AC filament connections to the tube. The two tubes at upper left have top connections, while at right one can see connections on the side of the base. The problem was all tubes only had four prongs. The same problem existed when they added the screen grid, the need for an additional connection. The tube at left has a side and top nut connection, while at right a single connection uh, on the side. And here they try adding a prong in the center. This British tube, or valve as they are called in England, had prongs on both ends. Now a panel of tubes manufactured between 1925 and 1930. It was during this period the screen grid tube was introduced with a grid cap on top. The first popular screen grid tube was the UX-222, seen here in a Pilot Super Wasp shortwave receiver. The screen grid eliminated the need to neutralize the tuned RF stage. Multi-element tubes became increasingly necessary as circuits became more complex. This is a circuit of an early superheterodyne. Note the separate oscillator and first detector tubes and the several IF stages, all with individual tubes.
Between 1930 and 1935, we saw the birth of all kinds of multi-element and multi-purpose tubes, thus reducing the number of tubes in a receiver. The popular UX four-prong was superseded by the UI five-prong, and then there came along the six-prong, and then a seven-prong, and finally the octal eight-pin base in 1935. Through the use of multi-element tubes, the old 10-tube set using triodes was now down to four tubes plus a rectifier. The four or five tube super hat became a favorite table model for several years. And a panel of tubes developed up to 1934. The octal and all metal tubes was introduced in 1935. This is a cutaway section of one of these tubes. The heater or filament is in the center surrounded by the cathode, various screens, and finally the outside cylindrical plate. The 1930s was the period of beautiful classic console receivers. This is a 1937 McMurdo Silver. The set uses 15 tubes. Note that all tubes other than the audio output and rectifier are shielded. Now that brings up the shield or all metal tube. One of the first shielded tubes was the cat gun made in 1933 in England. There were several variations of metal tubes but the true all metal tube was not released until 1935. And here they are, the nine originals. the uh, different components that make up an all-metal tube. Originally developed by GE and then RCA, other companies soon followed. One of the few holdouts, however, was Philco. They wanted no part of the new development. A panel of metal tubes. With eight pens, it was possible, in most cases, to eliminate the top grid cap. Glass counterparts were also manufactured. In 1938, Philco and Sylvania announced a new tube known as the Loctal. Note the wire pins instead of prongs. The pins went directly to the internal element, thus eliminating an operation. In the long run, Philco proved the all-metal tube wasn't necessary. The all-glass miniature tubes of the 40s and 50s was final proof. And how about VHF? The first real VHF tube was the Acorn 955 and 956 released in the mid-30s. We're looking at the RF section of an early two-meter set. Most VHF sets were modulated oscillator and a super regenerative receiver. However, if one wanted to go crystal control, it was necessary to have a tube for every doubling stage as seen here. Yes, it was five meters then, not six. With the advent of the power beam tetrode and pentode, requiring little drive, it was possible to go to two and six meters with a minimum of a circuitry. 
The 815 was one of the more popular tubes just before and after the war. One of the first tube manufacturers to specialize in high frequency transmitting tubes was the IMAC Corporation, seen at left. At far right is a panel of RCA lighthouse tubes developed in the 40s. And here are some other early transmitting manufacturers. How many can you remember? At left, we are looking at some Gamatrons made by Heinz and Kaufman, then some Rayathon tubes, and at far right, the Taylor tube. Now, any of these companies are making tubes today, which, of course, makes them all somewhat collectible and, of course, quite difficult to uh, replace. The tube historian can specialize in many areas, including the exotic. Like stamps or coins, the objective is to have one of each. And again, all of these panels are part of W2GK's collection in the engineering department at Manhattan College, New York City. The amateur station in the old days, before TVI, was frequently built on an open framework. This was my station of long ago. I'm still sentimental about the warm glow of the tubes and the flickering 866s. A modern transmitter doesn't present this pretty picture, does it? The last big change in tube development came in the 1940s when the all-glass miniature tube was released. In short time, most all other receiving tubes became obsolete. A beautiful receiver of the period was the Hammerlin SP-600. which used 19 tubes, most of which were glass miniatures. Tube production hit the peak in the 1950s, mainly because of television. Some television sets had over 30 tubes. One of the last innovations in tube technology was the Compactron, seen here with a 12-pin base. The last receiving tube released by RCA was one to compete with the transistor known as the Nuvistor, of which two are seen here with our old friend the 201A. Small and efficient for VHF and UHF, the Nuvistor could not compete with solid state. Of interest, most receiving tubes released by RCA after 1935 were developed by a fellow radio amateur, George Rose K2AH. And what's this? Well, I just had to show you uh, what a super power VHF transmitting tube looked like. This is a sectionalized display model. Its counterpart, the 6806, has a filament voltage of only one volt, but at 1,000 amperes. I repeat, one volt at 1,000 amperes. Practically a dead short. One of the first popular single sideband transmitters was the Central Electronics 100V, a phasing rig that came out in the 1950s. Rated around 100 watts, it used 26 tubes and required two men to carry it.
this could be the last of the modern all-tube amateur stations. A Collins KSW-1 transmitter and a Collins 75A-4 receiver. Are you interested in tubes? Various manufacturers printed tube manuals and all ARRL handbooks still carry tube specifications. Only two authoritative books have been written on the subject. Both are highly recommended to the tube historian. Obtainable at technical bookstores or from Vestal Press, Vestal, New York. And here are some vacuum tube historians. At left is Howard Schrader of Princeton, who at one time had over 20,000 tubes. In center, holding a tube, is the Grand Master of Tube Historians, Gerald F.J. Tyne. With them are Bob Morris, W2LV, and Harry Houck, one time Major Armstrong's assistant. The interest in tubes has no dividing line. One can even branch off into television camera tubes, such as iconoscopes, orthicons, viticons, and so on. It's an endless feel. And here's part of my collection, which I started in 1938. Howard Schrader cataloged his huge collection by manufacturer and country. while Tyne concentrated on the rare ones. This small group is worth well over $10,000. The use of tubes except for special applications or for the final linear have just about disappeared. But there still remains a certain nostalgia associated with the early days of radio. and the deep red glow of an old tube. Well, I guess that's it. So long, everyone.